In today's exciting episode, we have more UAP news coming out of Congress, an interview with Aero Chief Kirkpatrick, Enigma UAPs making headlines, and an interview with journalist Sarah Scholes. Stay tuned. <laughs> Let's get into it. Welcome to Open Mind UAP News. I'm your host, Alejandro Rojas, and in my face is my favorite mic that I finally found from my move, so hopefully the sound is much better for the podcast. I just love this mic, and I love talking into it because it sounds so good, but let's get into the news. That is what we're here for. There hasn't been a whole lot of UAP news going on, actually. It's been more dry than it has been typically, but probably because some of the issues that John Greenwald and I talked about in the last episode. However, when there is space, that's my specialty, helping to fill that space with cool UAP sightings. And we did have some good ones uh, recently. In fact, we're going to talk about this one later when we get into the sightings of the week. But the Daily Mail covered this where we had several sightings reported to us and videos submitted from Arizona, Utah, Nevada. I'm missing a state. California. Most of them from California. What was it? What is this weird blob of light? Some of them from one angle saw it look like a bow tie. We'll get into that and we'll talk about this. And my research into what these might be later on in the show. But space.com, this is kind of interesting. And this is actually really new. This is uh, from eight hours ago, reported from Brett Tingley, who was also on the show recently. Elon Musk says, I don't see any evidence of aliens. Uh, He says that his Starlink satellites have not dodged UFOs. Although that's not too surprising, just by using whether or not Starlink can dodge an object in space does not really uh, indicate whether or not there is one. I don't think he's probably had to dodge the International Space Station, for example. But Elon Musk has made several statements around his disbelief in that there's much there when it comes to UAP. We'll see. Uh, I disagree, but and we'll keep looking in other news that is kind of similar and getting into Arrow, the all domain anomaly resolution office that is set up by the Pentagon to look into UAP, also known as UFOs. And I'll use the term interchangeably, but they investigated a case and this case was brought to them by Matt Gates, or at least Matt Gates, uh, the congressman has been really into this case and pushing it. But Arrow did an investigation, and they found there wasn't much to it. They used this picture to show that it was probably some kind of balloon, perhaps even a self-luminous balloon. They showed an example of a balloon like this that maybe had gotten away, and these are some luminous balloons that they use to light up like movie sets or or work areas. Uh, Since then, some researchers have gone and asked them, and they said, no, we haven't had a balloon get loose like that. But uh, it was an example of what this could be, not necessarily that it is that. You can see the full report on the Aero website. Here's what it looks like. And actually, I'm going to do a deeper dive into this. I really haven't given it a, a deep look. So, And there are some claims out there that it didn't. this report did not encompass all of the evidence that is supposedly out there. Now, the proponents of the case, I'm not saying are necessarily the best when it comes to sharing information or or being accurate, and I'll show you what I'm talking about in a little bit here. Yeah, this, this report's out there if you want, and I'll get more into it next time. I just really haven't had the time to deep dive into this as, as much as it takes to really kind of give you a, a good overview, but that will be forthcoming. In other Aero news... There was a release of a paper by Arrow just recently, just in the last few days. Now, it's not an investigation. Essentially, it's just a paper warning people about the effects of forest perspective and parallax when it comes to looking at your videos. And that's something that we talk about quite a bit. So in other words, well, here's a picture. It shows how, you know, forest perspective is just this, something that's closer in the screen can look like it's bigger. So she's obviously not as big as the Leaning Tower of Pizza. And for those of you listening, uh, it's just, you know, you see a lot of these pictures with 
people pretending like they're holding up the Leaning Tower of Pisa in Italy. Um, That's not the case. They're just closer in the picture. And these often happen with birds and bug videos. So people take a picture that they took with their family and they're like, oh my gosh, what is this thing flying up in the air? Well, it's not something that is far away that is like a big UFO typically. It's typically like a bug or a bird that's that's closer to them. So this definitely happens. And one of those Navy videos that uh, supposedly showed an object flying across the ocean very quickly has been, you know, analyzed by NASA and others. And they've said, actually, the object wasn't moving quickly, the airplane was moving, making the object look like it was moving quickly. And that object was moving actually much slower. And there is analysis uh, on the aero site on that case that I'm talking about. But you know, if if, it's like if you took a, well, let me grab, I've done this before. Let me grab my UFO here. This is a UFO made by my good friend, Mark D'Antonio. But you know, if, if I was moving it looks like the background is moving. Uh, if I were to film that, maybe I'll try this here. It would look like the UFO is flying, but actually, let me do it. Here we go. As you can see, it wasn't the UFO moving. It was my phone moving, really. That made the background look like it was moving more quickly. And so that can mis- uh, also cause mistakes. So they're just kind of outlining this issue with that can happen with UFO videos. A little bit of an educational piece. However, much like the reporting that I had done earlier, uh, really it seems like Congress is pretty okay, at least the Senate side of things, with Arrow and letting them handle the investigations. We've heard a lot of information where people, even Marco Rubio saying, hey, if anybody has something to say or anybody wants something investigated regarding this topic, then they need to go to Arrow. Uh, Senator Gillibrand is saying the same. She did say, I want to have a public hearing, and that usually gets people really excited. What she says she wants to hear a public hearing about is essentially Arrow coming and giving them an update on their investigation. So she's not saying, I want to hear from some whistleblower who's making lots of wild claims. She's saying, I want to hear from Arrow. Uh, So Arrow is the name of the game when it comes to the government and Congress. Arrow is who Congress wants to do the investigations, and that's who Congress wants to hear from. Speaking of Arrow, there was a recent interview. In fact, this was just posted, what, a day ago? So very, very recent an interview with uh, Stephen Greenstreet from the New York Post and Sean Kirkpatrick. Uh, it's a pretty good interview. Uh, I do like it. It, to me, didn't give me a lot of new information. A lot of this is stuff that I've been covering for a long time here. Uh, also stuff that we saw in the Arrow report. And I've shared with you a lot of the details. One of the things, though, that I thought was most interesting is Greenstreet asked about Bum, 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 this cast of characters who I've been talking about quite a bit, the House UAP Caucus. And he asked, you know, have any of these people come to talk to you? And I think it's very interesting that Kirkpatrick said, no, none of these people came to Arrow to ask them about their investigations, about what they were up to. And that is very problematic in that, you know, I got a little frustrated on the last show when, you know, to the right of this picture, you see Representative Luna. And she made that comment that, you know, Kirkpatrick said there's nothing to UAP, which is not true. And she's getting mixed up UAP with aliens, two different things. UAP, UFOs, they both start with you because it means unidentified. We don't know what it is. Could be aliens, but we don't know that. We have to do research in order to discover and what the unidentifieds are, and maybe some will turn out to be aliens. Wouldn't that be exciting? But without research, we're not going to figure that out. Burchett there on the other side, on the left-hand side, we hear a lot from him, but all he really does is conspiracy, conspiracy, conspiracy to get on the news. John and I talked about that. Interestingly, Burleson, the guy in the stand here, is the one who just recently said, you know what? My instincts were right. 
I don't think there's anything to UFOs, which is unfortunate because there's obviously a national security and air safety concern when there are things up there. But the point being that this group has not been educated. They have not been educating themselves on the topic. And it's really frustrating because they are trying to get as much TV and screen time as possible. There's a documentary coming out recently, and the documentary filmmaker was there standing with Burchett, making a big deal out of that. Very unfortunate because he doesn't have any insights. He hasn't been in Congress for very long. He's been back home uh, Bigfoot hunting and other things. Not to disparage my Bigfoot hunter friends out there, but that, you know, he is a conspiracist. He's more of someone who just talks without backing it up with facts and information. And so I, I keep making this point because when people talk about Congress being concerned or Congress saying this or Congress saying that, there's a difference between spin and trying to sensationalize and get clicks and then looking at people who have actually done the research and looked into this. In my opinion, the Senate, the Senate Intelligence Committees, uh, the Senate Armed Services Committees, they are the most educated on this topic. They are backing Arrow and asking Arrow to do their research, but you'll find this as well. Those people who have genuine concerns, even genuine concerns with Arrow, are going to hold their cards close to their vest because the best thing to do is not really say, hey, I think there's a problem here until you have evidence you can lay down to support that. And that's why I think it's important that all of us be very savvy and all of us support NASA and all of us support Aero, try to help them while we help ourselves and encourage more money, more expertise being put into the research of UAP to figure out what they are and take advantage of that. Along the ways, if we find improprietaries, if we find information that doesn't jive, then we can call it out in a genuine conversation. Hey, now that I've got your attention arrow, there are a couple of things I want to ask you about. And then ask those questions when we're in a position to get answers. Um, and we're also in a position to continue to do our own research. There's just a right way and a wrong way to do things. And the getting out there and grandstanding and talking about, I'm so angry because you're holding all these secrets when you can't even prove the things that you're saying are the secrets really doesn't give you a stance of credibility. Um, and that is seen. It really is. And behind the scenes, then we have these people like Burleson. We have these people that uh, John and I were talking about in the last show who then lose their interest because they don't see that credible information to kind of drive or motivate their interest or support. And that's what we've got to do. That's why I'm really excited about working with Enigma, where we're sharing videos, we're sharing data and information that do get people excited. And in a little bit here, we will talk about some Enigma sightings, some that we can explain, maybe some that we can't. Uh, over time, maybe some of them will be explained, but I'm confident that not all of them will be explained. And I'm confident we're going to find mysterious things by researching UAP. And, and I'm confident that we'll also find things that will help move science forward. But now let's talk to our guest, Sarah Skulls. All right. Well, I'm very excited for this week's interview. Welcome, Sarah Skulls, a journalist. Uh, and, you know, you've been writing for Wired, Scientific American uh, more recently, which is exciting. Uh, but I also am excited that you're from Colorado. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good place to be. I, I lived in Denver for a long time, and now I'm up in the mountains, which is also great. I just want to dive into this because you have been really covering this topic, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you've been kind of looking into UFOs and that sort of thing, even prior to the infamous December 2017 reveal of uh, the Pentagon project. Yeah, a little bit. I think my my major interest started around the time of that article because of that article. But I've had a long mm -hmm. time interest in the uh, the extraterrestrial side of things and different different ways that people look for potential extraterrestrial intelligence. And mm -hmm. but I started taking the yeah the UFO side of UFOs seriously around around December twenty seventeen. Mm -hmm. And what was your reaction? Like, what uh, motivated you to kind of tackle the topic and write? articles about it. I think Wired was maybe your first one. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, Wired, my my editor at Wired actually just sent me the New York Times article about the Pentagon program and said, hey, you know, it seems like there's a lot of claims in this article and not all of them are super backed up by what's in the article. So can you kind of go through it, look at what's in there and see if you can find evidence for or against what they're what they're claiming about this Pentagon program. And so that was kind of the the origin of my work on it. And just in the mm -hmm. course of doing that, I talked to like historians and anthropologists and people who've been in the ufology field for a long time. And I just found them to be fascinating and also motivated by this kind of same things that motivated me, like solving a mystery, finding like a, a human story that was very persistent and trying to, to figure it out. So I, uh, yeah, I just continued down the rabbit hole, which I'm sure lots of your uh, listeners are familiar with. Mm hmm. Um, speaking of, you know, that New York Times article and, and what your editor had asked you to look into, which was kind of the veracity of the claims in the article. I think that's kind of been an ongoing theme really with media. And I'm sure we'll get more into this, not kind of doing their typical due diligence around these topics. And surprisingly, you know, uh, it was accurate or a good idea to call out some of the claims in that article, because a lot of them turned out to be not so correct. Yeah, yeah. It seems like a lot of the central things that made it such a sensational story are either not correct or not definitely correct. Like how much of this program was actually about studying UFOs, who led the program, who released the infamous videos of the UFOs. And those were all the kinds of things that I was was looking into. And yeah, I mean, it took years. I don't think, you know, my article didn't, uh, my first one didn't prove that much about what was right or wrong, but just kind of called into question, I think, you know, what do we have to back up these these claims in this article? Mm -hmm. What did you find was the reaction to that article? Hmm. Um, <clears throat> a mix, I think, you know, some people were glad to have, you know, it pointed out. I think anyone, um, when they read an article like that, that says the Pentagon has a UFO program, here's videos of UFOs, the first reaction is, wow, oh my gosh, like, this is crazy. And without looking, looking deeper into that. And I think, you know, my own reaction included at first. Um, and so I think people were grateful that, that maybe somebody called that into question, but then there were, there was also um, an unpleasant side of things of people who didn't like to have those claims questioned, who wanted to kind of stay in the, the, wow, that's amazing. Isn't it, isn't it crazy without looking deeper into them, I think. And so I got a little bit of hate for that article, I would say. Still, still actually get a little bit of hate for that article. Mm -hmm. And I think really, and this is what was kind of, I thought was peculiar or difficult was that I felt you were making, you were just questioning, um, you know, how do we know this? What about the background of these videos? You know, where did this, uh, who did this analysis and when are we going to see these analysis? Um, interesting enough, we've never seen them. So you for instance, we're correct to call these things out because, first of all, we didn't have those answers. We still don't have those answers, even though you were told uh, that those answers would come. And But just by questioning or raising these questions, which I felt were really valid, yeah, there was just this wave of negativity, uh, almost like you're questioning this, this new kind of La La Land, this new paradise these guys found themselves in that, you know, this is all being taken seriously. And you're like, well, let's wait a second. And they're like, what? <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, it became almost dogmatic. I think people who've been following UFOs for a long time, you know, really and understandably want to have uh, evidence, especially, you know, authoritative evidence from on high to to back up these interests that they've had for for a long time. And uh, to me, it's actually really important when when I also think that a topic is important to call those things into question. Like if it's an important topic that we need to be taking seriously, you also need to, to treat it seriously and question things. And I think, you know, people who are interested in it are actually the best people to do that because they have the interest of getting getting the truth out even if it's a truth that not everybody likes, I think. Mm -hmm. What about the reaction from journalists? I mean, how did you feel, I mean, maybe back then and how that has continued? Because I know you've kind of talked about how a lot of people throw reason out. Um, and like I, I mentioned, you know, it seems like, you know, a lot of journalists don't do their due diligence. 
it almost feels like a lot of journalists are just uncomfortable talking about the topic. How do you explain kind of those kind of things that we've been pointing out? Yeah, I mean, I think journalists can fall into the same trap as anyone else, especially with UFOs, which historically is a topic that hasn't been taken seriously. And so it doesn't get looked at with the same rigor as other topics. Like if you're talking about like a missile defense radar or something like that, people are going to ask questions and dig deep. But if they see a video of a UFO, journalists are just as likely, I think, to go wow, a UFO, or on the other side of the coin to say, uh, UFOs, UFOs are crazy. I'm not going to touch that subject with a with a 10 foot pole. So then I think you just end up with um, a lot of times the, the people who aren't questioning it. Um, you know, I, I was very nervous to cover it at first because I have mostly covered, you know, uh, hard science topics, scientific discoveries, technological advancements, things like that. And so I was a little nervous to, to wade into the... Uh, the what some people consider the fringier side of of things, but I actually had a mostly positive reaction. And I think, you know, journalists are just as interested in UFOs and mysteries as, as anyone else, even if they don't want to touch it themselves. And so so I would say it was mostly mostly a positive response. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, to your point, and maybe what people don't get is journalists do get excited about new bits of information and they want to grab that and understand that more. Um, so when you're questioning, it's not necessarily that, you know, they want to pile on uh, on the negative. They just want it, more information. Um, and when you're raising great questions about where this information is, how can we get it, you know, then everybody's interested in that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I, I mean, I think you see that in other realms, like if somebody discovers a new, the like the biggest black hole or something, people are interested mm -hmm. in that. If you discover, you, you know, a new black project spy plane or something like that, people, we, I think journalists are motivated by curiosity and interest and mystery. And, and so um, I think it, it, it makes sense that uh, both that it's a topic they would pursue and also maybe that it's a topic they wouldn't always pursue super rig rigorously because they, that excitement does kind of just get locked in. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the negativity, because I think this is really important. I think that uh, that negativity has stalled some of the research, the more credible, serious research that could happen in this field, such as NASA, even calling that out and saying, you know, these waves of, of just threats, even physical threats to members of the panel that were looking into the topic uh, has really dissuaded people from from wanting to get involved because why do you want to put yourself through that? And it seemed like there was a lot of negativity uh, slung your way, even by some of the, you know, hot, some of the former officials. Like, did you what was that experience like for you? Uh, yeah, it was a deeply unpleasant experience. I, th I think I've never I've written about a lot of controversial things. Like I just wrote a book about nuclear weapons, um, written about sexual harassment, like lots of controversial topics. And I've never been uh, trolled the way I was <laughs> writing about UFOs. Um, I think there's kind of like a groupthink mentality that can come in. So if somebody started coming to, to criticize my reporting for usually just for not adhering to their own point of view, um, you know, people are part of a community. And so then that community would kind of glom on and it would just be like days of, of uh, negative things. And even, even if I didn't agree with them, even if I felt like I could stand by my reporting, I think it caused like a, a high baseline of, of stress while it was going on for sure. And I know that, um, you know, I know a few people who were on the, the NASA panel that was also investigating UAP data um, who had a similar experience and walked away from it being like, I don't need to touch that ever again because I don't, I don't want that kind of attention. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think it, I think it comes from, it's a very emotional topic and very personal mm -hmm. topic for a lot of people in a way that maybe something like nuclear weapons also controversial is not like, it's not something people have deep in their hearts in a way that they have UFOs and, I think I think that's where it comes from. And so when I told myself that I had a little more empathy, like, you know, I'm just mm. <laughs> threatening an emotional experience that that they have had. Yeah. And I found it very strange that, you know, some of these individuals that were pushing this this negativity, your direction, um, were just yet yeah, 
former intelligence. Like I know one uh, former intelligence person who had said, if she's at a conference and I'm not going to speak. And that's just very odd. Uh, and it seems very inappropriate for, you know, former intelligence people to be participating in bullying like this. Yeah, I mean, I kind of always thought, you know, if if your arguments can't stand up to my arguments, then I don't know, we should we should be able to be on the same stage or have a convert like have a civil conversation. And if you can truly stand by what you're saying, then you shouldn't be so threatened by what I'm saying, and we should be able to engage in a, a respectful dialogue. Um, but yeah, I mean, I got accused of being a government shill paid by the government quite a bit, which um, I'm definitely not, <laughs> or um, yeah, a, a disinformation agent or just like a very bad journalist. And I think, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you could, uh, we, we can all criticize each other's arguments maybe instead of criticizing each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, are you sure you don't have a closet full of black suits and uh, white shirts and black hats? Yeah, I mean, you'll <laughs> never know. You'll never. If I told yeah. you, I'd have to tell you. So. <laughs> yeah, and you know the funny thing is also is that I don't really see where you made any personal kind of attacks. You and I don't even see any instances where you were wrong. Like, I can't think of, you know, and I'm sure if you were uh, knowing you and your work and your integrity, you would be happy to say, you know, this was one where it turned out I, I had a wrong take. But it, were there any instances where you felt like, you know, you called into question something that wasn't didn't turn out to be something that should have been questioned? Um, I don't think so. And I do. You always, you know, I, I hate to do it because it's embarrassing, but if there's a correction needed to a story, I will always email the publication and say, like, we need to fix this. I think there are probably mm -hmm. there are still things that are maybe um, open questions that I had hypotheses about that might turn out to be wrong. Um, but I don't think there's anything I said that was true that's not or, or vice versa. Um, mm -hmm. But if one of the listeners thinks of something, let me know and I'll tell the editor to make a correction. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. and I want to get into some of that stuff because I, I didn't run across anything like that. For instance, you were questioning where how those Navy videos were released. I don't know that we even to this day have a clear answer. Um, I think, you know, Chris Mellon, who received them from for to the stars, said he got them in a package in a in a garage type of situation so he hasn't revealed where they came from you even called out or were provided that that dobster release where you know there was but even then you know since that article we found out the air force investigated the release of those videos because they also had some question and it turned out there were some improprietaries they, that that it was released not to the fault of anybody who released them um but you know kind of some bureaucratic sort of mistakes that had happened there. Mm -hmm. um, so that was proper to call those out. Um, and then when it comes to whether they show something unusual, NASA has kind of debunked one of them and explained one. The other two are kind of up in the air. But like any video alone, you know, video just isn't enough data to be conclusive. Right. And I think, you know, at the, at the time back then in 2017, 2018, uh, the powers that be uh, in the UFO world were, were kind of saying like there is more data to come. You know, we're going to have radar data. There's all this other stuff we could get. And as far as I know, that hasn't really materialized. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, what one of what one of the national security researchers I talked to that first article um, said to me was like, you know, these these videos are completely decontextualized. They don't have a beginning. They don't have an end. We don't know that much about uh you know what happened before what happened after what people thought of them at the time it's just like a, a snippet of time without any context and it's hard to draw any conclusions from that and i think if i recall correctly that's kind of what i was saying like yeah sure maybe these show something extraordinary but you can't tell from the video itself whether that is true or not right which you know uh, which is something i've always talked to to my listeners about is that that's typically the case you need more than just video um, video rarely can be conclusive. And the the biggest hallmark cases uh, in the field don't include video, uh, but they may include right. radar, which is kind of a better sensor data to to give you more information about 
um, these objects. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think, um, you know, the, the, the personal accounts of some of the people that were um, allegedly involved with these encounters, like their experiences didn't match up with the video. And so to me, something really compelling would be all of those things coming together. The video, the personal accounts, the radar, you know, reports, things like that. That's uh, that's my my dream UFO world, I guess, is getting all that stuff to match up. Right. And I think people feel like the, the two, you know, main witnesses, two of the Navy jet fighter pilots, uh, Alex Dietrich and, and David Fravor, that their testimony um, is much more compelling than the videos. Yeah, I think so. And I think that that makes sense from just a, a human perspective perspective. And also like those were stories. They did have beginnings. They did have ends. They were fully contextualized. And so I think that that makes sense. At the same time, it's much harder to prove or, to, you know, you can't replicate it, which is hard from like a scientific perspective also. Mm -hmm. Let's maybe talk about that. Anecdotal evidence and science. Uh, and I think that's a, the crux of a lot of the argument. And I've had this debate recently, even with some very you know, credible people who, who I believe do have high integrity. They don't understand why anecdotal information can be used in a court of law, but not when it comes to science. And could you speak to that a little maybe? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I would start with the fact that, you know, anecdotal evidence is very compelling. And I think it's the kind of evidence that we respond to most just as people relating to people. And also that like, science isn't necessarily the best way to investigate or understand everything that that happens in the world. So with that caveat, the purpose of science is to gather data, interpret it in as objective a way as possible. And I ideally, um, although this is hard with with UFOs or UAP, be able to replicate it or at least understand it within the conditions where it happened. And, you know, when you're talking about an anecdotal experience that's that's personal, that relates to one person's senses and experience and how their brain interpreted that. And that's not replicable um, at all. And so it's just, it's much harder to, to investigate it in a scientific way without those things in place. Anecdotal information, you know, can be useful for pointing out a phenomena or pointing people in the right direction. It's just not the end all be all when it comes to science. And I think that's what's frustrating for people is that, okay, we've gotten to this point and they feel like we've got a lot of answers, but we don't really. We've got a lot of anecdotal information. I think what's exciting now is now's the time to start gathering data so data can be analyzed. And I think that's possible and that's what NASA and DOD want to do, but we'll see if there's much motivation at this point. Um, what are you hearing out there? Do you think NASA will get back in the mix? They've kind of talked about it. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the purpose of that original study was kind of to to see what kind of data the agency might have access to that that would be useful for this. And that's all the, the funding was for. It wasn't actually to do the analysis. And I think, um, you know, a lot of that study was driven by the leadership at the time and NASA's leadership changes often, including with presidential administration. So I think it will require um, someone at the top continuing to have an interest in it. Um, I do think that, you know, there's a lot of will within the the DOD to, to continue to study UAP and gather more data and make more reports. And that's because, you know, what whatever they are or are not, you know, people do see things they can't identify, um, service members do. And from a safety perspective, for them personally and for the country, it is important to understand what those things are and kind of the, the frequency of them. And so I I see um, the will and probably the money for that to continue. And I think that, you know, NASA and the DOD are not quite as separate as we think of them as being. They're oftentimes kind of synergistic. And so I think that could have an influence in, in that direction. So we'll see. I mean, I'm, I'm in favor of more um, more rigorous study and, and more things like we have going on. So I, I would love to see them actually get some of that data analyzed. Me too. And then, you know, I guess what we haven't covered is kind of this more recent arc, which I think a lot of journalists were were hesitant to cover. Um, and maybe we could speak to that because I think there's some confusion from people with that. But this uh, whistleblower, you know, David Grush coming out, um, making his claims, uh, a bit of a sensation there, uh, certainly in Congress. 
but not a whole lot of coverage. And, um, you know, that story is almost kind of come and gone. Um, and I don't think you covered it either. So uh, maybe you could explain why you think journalists were hesitant to cover it and what the effects of that kind of episode might have been. Yeah, I think journalists were probably hesitant to cover it because um, kind of like the, the anecdotal evidence we were just talking about, it was pretty much all secondhand information and is also a step farther down the 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 what some would consider the fringy lane of things, you know, talking about um, cr crashed uh, crashed objects and in some cases, you know, uh, actual entities. And I think, you know, some people who might be willing to talk about UAP that might be uh, drones or something, you know, talking about whether alien spaceships have crashed here on Earth is like a step too far for them. But but I think I do think the bigger thing was that like I was waiting to cover it to see if more evidence did come to light, um, not just like, oh, I heard this from someone and I can't talk about it outside of a uh, a skiff I, that's classified. I can't talk about it. And so to me, I wanted to wait until there were things that we could talk about and there was more evidence. And I think um, I haven't kept up on the full details of the latest, but I think uh, Grush and his story seemed to be on a, a downward spiral in some of the evidence that that he was planning to provide to the people who do have the appropriate clearances didn't really materialize. So, I mean, if, if that changes, I would be happy to cover it. And I'm sure a lot of people would too. And I think that they would be, you know, excited if there were any evidence in that direction. But I think a lot of people are kind of just waiting it out. Yeah, you know what? I think that's a really great point because that's certainly a sentiment out there. And and out of the journalists I know who have talked about this topic, you know, they're they're the same. Hey, we'll cover it if anything comes of it. But thus far, it's only been talk and, and no evidence, which I think is fair. And I think that, you know, that should be enlightening to some of the audience here. Uh, and that I also got this sense of some journalists saying, you know, we be, we listen to these people. We went down this road with them because it was very compelling that was something was going on. And we thought it was great that, you know, Arrow was established and, and all of this. And it's being taken seriously by NASA and Congress. But once you went a step further, you went back to where you were, why, why we were hesitant to cover this in the first place. You went back to anecdotal information that was second or third hand that was not substantiated. And they were skeptical that that information would be substantiated and thus far it has not and it's been quite some time now uh, let alone uh the aero historical report coming out and having some pretty you know compelling and convincing information showing that hey a lot of this was was a case of mistaken identity best case mm -hmm. right right and and you know i mean that's exactly why i think things like arrows investigations are really helpful for kind of, I mean, if, if you do have an interest in this topic and, and you want to take it seriously, what you want to do is weed out the things that don't have evidence that are only anecdotal and, or maybe are misidentified and, and focus on the things that are, that might be truly weird or that we don't understand whatever the explanation ends up being. And so I think f focusing things in that direction is actually really valuable for the skeptics and maybe the believers alike. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like you, like you said, you're willing, if something comes up to cover it, um, you know, if you get that opportunity and do you think that's kind of the, the appetite out there with journalism and uh, media right now, like that they're not necessarily ignoring something for, for no good reason. They're just waiting for something juicy and, and waiting for something more substantial. I think so. And I think, you know, after the 2017 article, there was there was quite a bit of coverage really for years of all of the different developments. And I think journalists kind of got tired of nothing really happening in the same way that the public did and, and ufologists did of like, OK, this is more of the same old, same old and nothing is really changing and we don't have any more evidence. And I think, um, you know, people just grow weary and also more skeptical and, and want to wait it out. But yeah, I think that I would cover it. And, and so would, so would they, um, I don't, and I have actually kind of heard, um, you know, I know some people think maybe there's like an information blackout sometimes at, at mainstream media outlets that like, Oh, they don't want to, they're, they don't want to cover this. Um, but I've heard the opposite that people's editors, 
um, if they're on staff at a publication, when there is UFO news, say, you know, this is going to be very popular. People are very interested. I need you to cover it, whether you like it or not. And I think that's actually more the attitude of publications than mm -hmm. than any kind of blockade against it. Mm -hmm. Which makes a lot of sense. And, you know, this kind of arc we just talked about is kind of a, an example where those journalists who did kind of jump in uh, full throttle on the topic are now kind of like, eek, you know, um, maybe I was wrong about some of this. And you kind of eat crow a little bit. And like you mentioned earlier, none of us want to be in that position. <laughs> no, no, we don't. And, um, and I think, um, you know, as if, if there's a reporter who's been covering it for years, like you just like anybody else, you gain knowledge, you gain experience, you gain perspective, and you just have a different uh, sense of what you think is important to actually cover than you did when when everything was new to you. Like, we're as, we're as subject to that as anybody else, I think. Mm -hmm. And I guess for perspective, like, what would you say for people who are interested in this topic and, and do want to see more coverage and, and may be frustrated? Like, what would you say to them? Um, I think I would say that, you know, we are all in this. Um, we we would all like to see the same thing, which is meaningful coverage of UFO topics. And so I don't know what power anyone has to help any you know evidence or data come come to light. But to whatever extent people like if you come across something um, that seems really substantiated or you have a particular insight, I think, you know, um, reaching out to respected journalists about that um, is not a bad idea or, um, you know, just trying to make it public in your own spheres, but um, not not bombarding anyone with with false or fluffy information, I think. Yeah, I think those are really good points. And I mean, it's great to hear that, you know, the sentiment that we are all in this together and we are all looking for answers because in my experience, especially when it comes with, to journalists, that's how they feel. They, they, they would love that big, juicy piece of information that proves something and that they're looking for. I'm that way myself. If I had it, if I could say Roswell was aliens, you know, I would love to be able to say that and prove that. But, but that's just not the case. I don't have that kind of information. So I think that's what people really got to hold on to. Yeah, definitely. And I think, I think a lot of the, the, people who have, you know, negative, negative feelings toward people who ask questions or are a little bit um, more skeptical than they are, you know, don't, don't fully understand what you just said. Like if someone handed me actual evidence that I could substantiate that, like, um, I was wrong about everything, you know, there's a, there's a crashed saucer in my backyard, there's alien occupants in it, and the CIA took it away. Like I, would love nothing more than to, to write that story and say I was wrong about lots of things. I don't um, have a problem with that at all. Yeah. And I think that that's another thing. That's what I really appreciate about journalists and scientists that really money is typically not on the top of their, their head. That's not what they're thinking about. That's not why they went into their careers to make money, but instead they're in their, uh, to discover things and to uncover truths. And that's their true passion is to kind of get that stuff out there, uh, which gets really frustrating for me when people think otherwise, because certainly, you know, if the CAA is even ponying up cash, that's not necessarily what everybody's looking for. Right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, if journalists were in it for the money, they would have entirely different careers. Um, it's just exactly. not how it works. But I think, yeah, curiosity and a desire to kind of dig dig out facts that no one has dug out before is fundamentally what motivates journalists. And, you know, unless a boss, a boss is breathing down their neck, they're writing about things they're personally interested in. And so if someone is doing it, it's because they care about it. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I would love to ask also, is there something about the topic that we didn't cover that you've kind of wanted to voice or, or share? I mean, I think, uh, you know, we, we are kind of in a lull in um, UAP information right now. But I think that with, you know, I do think that the military maintains its interest um, in the topic, maybe for different reasons than people 
in the public, but I do think that eventually interesting things will come out of that. But the, you know, the wheels of government turn slowly and the interesting things will probably not be what we expect or what a lot of people hope. But I do think that there will probably be kind of a resurgence, um, whether it's five years or 10 years or things like that. Like there will, there will eventually be more data and analysis than there is now, I think. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing. It was a, a pleasure and an honor to have you on. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much to Sarah for joining us. Uh, I know it's probably can be nerve wracking, you know, talking about this topic, because every time that you do, it riles up a lot of people. In fact, the episode with John that we did last time riled up a lot of people, and I'm sure this one will as well. But you know, I really do appreciate the skeptics. I don't mind them coming in and saying, hey, I don't think what you got is what you think it is. I think it's this. And, you know, they check our information and what we're going to go over and what we do go over a lot when we talk about these cases is that there isn't enough data to be conclusive. It can show us that perhaps this happened or perhaps that happened or give us confidence that, wow, something really unusual happened here. But we need to gather data in order to really do the calculations and prove that something spectacular took place. So that's what's necessary in order to move this research forward. And skeptics help us say, hey, you know, you haven't done uh, your due diligence. You still haven't proven to me it's not this, this or that. And that's just setting the bar. So we've got to then work harder to do that. And it doesn't mean the skeptics are the arbiters. Really, it's kind of a consensus among the scientific community that are the arbiters when it comes to uh, the veracity of something. But, you know, when we fight to get them on board or to address their concerns, then we're getting closer and closer to getting that consensus. And not only that, it shows that we are genuinely listening to all of the feedback in order to answer all questions. And we're not just ignoring people in order to live in our little bubble and fantasy land and, you know, echo chamber where we can repeat our beliefs over and over with like-minded people. That's not going to move things forward. What will move things forward is addressing those concerns from those people who are saying, hey, you're just not there yet. And when we get there, that's what's going to be exciting. And we are going to get there. But let's look at some sightings. We have partnered with Enigma Labs to bring you interesting UAP sightings weekly that they collect via their app and website. If you have a report to submit, you can download the app at the Apple App Store and submit it via the website at enigmalabs.io. In the interest of full disclosure, I am a paid consultant for Enigma, and that is how I can keep up to date on the best videos that come in, and I'm excited to share them with you here on the show. So let's go ahead and take a look. Ah, who's that? Mr. Burleson? You're not a UFO. But this is, so this is really cool. So here's a sighting from California, Mariposa, um, California in the United States. This was at, the time here is off a little bit. There's a glitch. We're fixing that. It's actually about 7.30 p.m. that this was captured. But look how strange this is. It's just this glob of light in the sky. Really weird one. But that's not the only one. We actually found several of these. Oh, and I I should mention, because you probably see that thing scrolling across the top. The new merch store is live. We do have a merch store for Enigma that is by popular demand. We had a lot of people saying, hey, I want some merch. Um, So we're like, okay, we'll put up a store. So we do have a store up there now. In fact, I'll show it to you at the end. But there are some cool products that you can get um, to check those out. You'll want to check those out also. In fact, I'll probably wear one of the hats next week or something or next show. But anyway, let's look at some more of these sightings. In fact, this one has another video. But this video is very similar. This white kind of glob in the sky. Moving on, here's Sonora, California. Same thing, right? This one says it was captured at at um, 9.20 p.m. The witness says it's a very bright, hazy object traveling from east to west. The object resembles a comet without a tail. 
Next one. This is from 29 Palms in California out there in the desert. It's a better view. It's brighter. But let's watch this one for a little longer because you'll notice it's, a, it's another glob, but it starts to get smaller and smaller. And eventually it disappears. So in several of these videos, they got the object disappearing. They talked about theirs at nine o'clock. Um, it looks like it disappeared behind the building on this one. They say, we were outside in the courtyard and I noticed a bright light in the sky traveling towards our direction. It appeared to have a spotlight on both sides of the object. As it traveled, it appeared to be turning, then moved upwards and then faded to black. No green, red, or flashing lights were observed. The lights appeared to be shining through a cloud or fog, but the sky was clear. No shape could be viewed on the object. And that's a good point that they make, that the skies were clear. And all of these, you can see clear skies. In this one now, this is in Oroville, California. Same thing, big white blob. Looks like a light that it is inside of a haze, just like they were talking about. This one almost seems like maybe you can see two lights, but you do see the light fade out on this one. In the description, they wrote, we live by an airport. This was not an airplane, a planet, a star, or a comet, or a fireball, or a drone, a satellite, or a rocket. We are familiar with them all as we are used to rocket launches and what they look like. This has something that appeared out of nowhere and disappeared into thin air. Here's another one. I believe in this one, the video fades again, looks just like the others. This one says her son and her were out for a walk. I'm assuming it's a woman. I'm not sure, but they live about 30 minutes north of Luke Air Force Base. So this one's here in Phoenix. That's where I am in uh, Arizona, Peoria, Arizona, which is just uh, another suburb of Phoenix. But they said they noticed the light and they started filming they do, and this is great. They say the small yellow light moving around in the video seems to be a reflection from the nearby street light. Yes, yay. Because of course I've done that where I've shown you guys that a bright light in you know the picture will create this internal reflection. And these people were smart enough to observe that, you know, one of those things in the picture is that internal reflection. And again, yeah, here you see it fade out. Moving on, Honey Tree Drive in Las Vegas. Viva Las Vegas. They got it there too. So look at this, another blob. So when I saw this, I thought, wow, that's got to be a rocket. Why? Because it's a bright light inside of a haze, and it looks like otherwise sunny day. That's often what we see because usually this luminosity is due to gases off of the rocket being illuminated or um, the rocket still cruising along and those gases being illuminated by the rocket engine. So going off of that assumption, I looked at SpaceX. Hey, why don't we both look? And look, here we go. May 2nd, when the sighting was on Thursday, May 2nd at 1136 a.m. Pacific time, there was a launch out of California, Vandenberg um, Space Force Base in California. Well, that would be it, except for that was much earlier in the day. This is around noon, and you can see the picture. It was a daytime launch, so that can't be it because it was during the day. It was in Vandenberg, and that's the right place because a lot of these people say they caught, saw it coming from the northwest. And northwest of some of these locations, like Arizona, would be California, like Vandenberg, or maybe China Lake, or maybe even Nellis Air Force Base, the home of Area 51. Ooh, mysterious. Could it have been launched from Area 51 by aliens? Just kidding about the aliens part. So I looked at another one. Let's see, there was another launch here. This was at 10.37 p.m., Eastern time in Florida. So that's Eastern. People were reporting this at around 9 p.m. Pacific. That would put it at about 7.37 p.m. that this launch happened out of Florida, all the way on the other side of the country. Could that be it? No. I mean, that was at 7.37 p.m. And everybody was seeing this 
about 90 minutes later. But wait a second. So I call up my buddy, Ben, and we both look at this flight tracker of the Florida launch. So there it goes, launching out of Florida. This little um, line that you see, and and for those of you listening, this is a website called flightclub.io. And you can look up launches, and it will give you this 3D imagery of the trajectory of the launch. This first part is the rockets that are retrieved. So that's what's so great about SpaceX rockets is they're reusable. So that first stage, which is the first part of the rocket, um, can come back and they capture it. And at the end of this line is where they capture it. So that's where the first stage was. So the second, second stage flew around the country. It takes about 90 minutes for them to orbit the country or the planet. And lo and behold, about 90 minutes later, would put it at about nine o'clock. Um, and it does come right over California. Look at that, ladies and gentlemen. So could this be it? Maybe. So maybe what they saw was the second stage, which is the upper part of the rocket. And the rocket was somehow outgassing. Maybe it was thrusting and maneuvering um, and gases were coming out. Or these second stages, from what I understand, will continue to orbit or they might just burn up in the atmosphere. And that's what it could have been, too. So what they saw could have been the second stage. I don't know for sure because neither of us are are educated enough on what happens to that second stage. We did do some research to look that up. And what we found was that they do continuously orbit or they may um, burn up in the atmosphere, uh, something like that. So the second stage would have been in the right place. Um, And it is rocket looking. So maybe that's what they saw. Now, before people criticize me and say, well, what about your quotes in the Daily Mail? Well, in the Daily Mail, I did say, I think it might be a rocket, but I'm not sure because there weren't rocket launched at rocket launches at that time. And um, it's true. I didn't. I just figured this out recently with uh, my buddy Ben Hansen. Speaking of Ben Hansen, you know, that sighting out of New York that I I was telling you guys about last time, that did blow up in the media. So News Nation covered it, and my buddy Ben Hansen went out and was talking about it um, because, lo and behold, he was doing an independent investigation on his own at the same time that I was looking into it. So he's like, dude, I've been looking into this, and I've got some, some stuff on it, which is really cool. And in fact, we are going to have a Twitter Spaces on Monday, it's going to be at 4 p.m. Eastern, which is about 1 p.m. Pacific. It'll be about 30 to 45 minutes. So it's going to be on Twitter or X. Uh, ben is going to be there and he's going to share his research. He's also worked with a, a scientist who works with um, the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies, which I've been a board member of. And he did some 3D modeling to figure out a little bit more about that LaGuardia, New York sighting that I had told you about last time and that we have seen now kind of blow up in the media. We're also going to have Navy jet fighter pilot or former Navy jet fighter pilot Alex Dietrich in there with us. And she's going to give us some insight and some points of view on that sighting as well. So that's going to be a lot of fun. That's free for anybody. Just watch my social media or Enigma Lab social media to find out how to come join us on that Twitter spaces. That'll be a lot of fun. So we'll have Ben there talking about that too. So here's another case that is out in the media. Really interesting one. If you disagree with me, let me know. If you think I'm right, let me know. If you're just like not sure, just say, yeah, you could still let me know. I don't mind. (laughs) But contact information is in the description and along with links to these sightings. So if you want to go take a look at them, you'll be able to do that especially if you want a closer look. But now let's look at the sighting that has me scratching my head because every show I'm doing a sighting I can't explain. Maybe eventually I'll explain it, but I don't know quite what it is yet. So let's take a look. This sighting is Enigma number 288257. This is from Grays Harbor in Hoquiam, Washington, 
do let me know if I've got that wrong. Those of you watching the video are already probably seeing this video going, whoa, what's that, dude? Because this is a really weird one. It supposedly occurred, uh, or what, it occurred on February 5th, 2024, at, again, this is probably 9.32 p.m. because we've got those numbers a little messed up uh, on the website. But again, this will be fixed. I mean, this is going to be fixed, like, probably by the end of the day. But uh, a little glitch there. But 9.32 p.m., the witness says they observed a light moving across cloudy sky erratically. I'm reading exactly what they wrote. Not resolved with binoculars. Path appeared to be over the harbor near the mouth of the harbor to the Pacific Ocean. So in this video, you see this light coming from the left, moving very erratically. It's really weird. Um... I wish I knew a little bit more about this one and the camera that it's on. Is it a security camera? Could it possibly be a spider web where it's catching some reflection? I mean, that happens a lot with security cameras. But what we see here for the listeners is kind of a view of the city and a horizon. It's a cloudy day. There's thunder off in the distance, uh, some lightning. In fact, this makes me think I got to talk to my ball lightning buddies because this could be an example of that. But you see this luminous orb just moving very erratically and strangely across the screen. And what I mean by erratically is that it kind of moves forward, moves back, moves forward a little bit. Um, mostly not a whole lot of change in elevation. It's not moving up and down so much as it, it is back and forth. It gets brighter and then it gets dimmer. The video is only 26 seconds, but it's really hard to determine what it is with that little bit of time. It's too bad. And I do recommend whenever you're writing a report or whenever you're taking a video, do video until it disappears, if possible. And when you write your report, tell us how did you notice this thing and how did you lose sight of the thing? So did you stop looking because you got bored? That happens sometimes. Or did it get fly off and then it was gone? It gives us a lot more information about the nature of what is being seen. In this case, it could only be a few seconds because it was a security camera. And kind of like my security camera, uh, you know, I've got it set where it'll give me a 20 second video and then I can go in there and manually go look at it and make a longer video if I want. But yeah, this is a really weird one. This is pretty strange. I cannot explain this. It is Enigma number 288257. So those of you who are listeners can pull out your Enigma app and look that one up right now. You'll find it in the content feed, which is that first button on the bottom left of your Enigma app where you can kind of get a feed of some of the good videos. In fact, if you want a preview of the videos that I'll probably feature on the show that I can't explain, that's where you'll see them. But this is a very strange one, and I would love all of your feedback to help me figure out what in the heck is this. So there we go. That is the what the heck is this, the one I can't explain. Uh, hopefully some of you out there will be able to help me out. And you know what gets me really excited? I talked about ball lightning earlier. Ball lightning is something that is suspected to exist, but we don't know that it does. And science is trying to find answers to whether or not it does. It does seem like it's a phenomenon that is likely to occur. Uh, but if we can figure out under what conditions and what the nature of the phenomena, then we'll be able to kind of rule those out. That'll be an identified and we won't have to bother with those type of things again. Even more exciting, though, if we can find it, us UAP researchers help these scientists figure this out, it will demonstrate the scientific value of UAP research because, you know, no doubt some of these things that we're going to find are going to be prosaic. They're not going to be that exciting. Well, by lightning is a little bit exciting. At least I get a little bit excited about it, but I know others don't. 
Uh, regardless, it is a scientific discovery. We're finding out more about our natural world we didn't know before. And that's what's a, so exciting about UAP research to me and why I think it is definitely something worth doing. And I hope to be able to further encourage UAP research in the future. And I do plan, and I do have plans underway to do that, um, some of which I'll be able to let you know really soon. In fact, it just takes a lot of time, paperwork, um, to get some of this stuff rolling. But uh, yeah, I do some have some exciting stuff planned for the future. Anyway, I've got exciting stuff planned for the future of the show as well. I hope you enjoyed today's show. Thank you very much to Sarah Scholes for joining us today. You'll find the links to all of those stories that I covered earlier and the Enigma UAPs or not so unidentified objects uh, in the links below as well. So you can go take a look for yourself. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And we'll catch you next time. Mm -hmm.